Powell River. He is the Chief Medical Officer of the First Nations Health Authority in Vancouver and the former Deputy Provincial Health Officer for Aboriginal Health. Dr. Adams has a Master's of Public Health from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is the past president of the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada and former director of the Division of Aboriginal People's Health at the UBC. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you told him I was an actor. He's still trying to keep, take me seriously. Great, um, I, I really listened uh, with, uh, you, know, you know, I was all ears, all ears listening to your presentation and at the very last moment I really wanted to add some more information uh, to my slides in, in response, but I will stick with uh, what I have now. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Oh, that's me, thanks. Gosh, I do everything myself. Um, this is, uh, my name is Tesla Evan Adams. Uh, this. Uh, is an island in my territory. It's called Ayus. It's called Savory Island now. And Savory Island in my territory is cut in half along its spine. And one half uh, is completely undeveloped. It's still, um, it's still part of our territory. We hold possession of it. It's completely undeveloped. There isn't a tap there. There are no concrete pads. There are no homes. There's no sewage system whatsoever. And on the other side of the island is um, 3,000 postage size stamped pieces of the most expensive real estate in the country. Uh, and um, the two sides of the island don't really mix. I think uh, the homeowners don't know if they can actually go on reserve and um, take uh, foodstuffs and traditional foods um, from um, First Nations lands. And I think um, First Nations people don't know if they can actually go into other people's yards and collect clams that they, or clams and other seafoods that they co have collected for generations up until, you know, until the 60s. Um, and this island, this metaphor, speaks to me of the two solitudes uh, in Canada. Um, you would think that in an island setting where they need to share resources that, um, and things like it has a very low water table, and so instead of fighting over water, that they would find a way to share that precious uh, resource. And you'd think that since they are essentially married for eternity, that there would be honor between them, that there would be respect between them, that they actually would get together uh, and have some fun instead of um, never encountering each other. And I wonder if there was a kidney transplant center here on this island, on which side of the island would that transplant, transplant center be? And if it was um, on the non-First Nation side, would there be a bus system to bring um, First Nations people um, to that transplant center? Or would it be up to the First Nations um, to find their way there? Um, would that service be hard to reach um, for them? The concept of Aboriginal people or original peoples um, is not unheard of in the world. There are actually 300, 300 million original peoples in various countries like the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Alaska, and Hawaii, um, many parts of um, Asia, including India, uh, where original peoples were moved aside for waves of migration. And migration is not a dirty word. Migration exists in every country um, on the planet. And so this sharing of resources is not uh, an unholy and bizarre thought. It actually is fairly normal. This is one of my elders. I always remember her because she didn't go to residential school. Um, as many of you know, by law, First Nations people were not allowed to raise their own children. Um, their children were taken for them and inst from them and institutionalized. And her mother said, um, the creator gave me children to raise. I didn't like the idea of someone doing it for me. And so they went on the run in the bush and they were, they were never caught. And so I asked her, I said, what was your life like as a child, not in school? And she said, and uh, this is word perfect. She said, there was nothing to do, there was nothing to do but help the people. And so her life was about going out into the community and doing whatever needed doing. And sometimes it was very easy work. And sometimes it was very, very painful, um, mind boggling, difficult work that had to do with um, you know, the trials and tribulations of life. Um, 
she reminds me about uh, self-determination. One of the social determinants of indigenous health as defined by the um, World Health Organization is self-determination. And self-determination is the right of a nation to determine its own course uh, without um, influence from other nations. Or on an individual level, the right of the individual to plot the course of their own life without interference um, from other individuals. And in the social determinants of indigenous health are the usual social determinants of health, such as educational outcomes, um, income, housing, uh, but also in on that list are issues like um, language and culture uh, and family, that the presence or the absence of family can be a hindrance or um, help one um, be better in mind, body, and spirit. Here in this um, province, uh, we have actually quite a sophisticated approach to indigenous people uh, and their health and their um, outcomes. We have formal agreement between us, between the federal government, the provincial government, and First Nations governments um, to address the health, to address inequities, but particularly health inequities. And I think it is highly immoral for one racial group to um, have um, enforced health outcomes that are different and better than another ethnic group, that in a just and civil society, we, tr we would try and address those inequities. And First Nation people are asking for, maybe even demanding, equality uh, in health outcomes. I would also say that um, First Nations people, uh, I think, find it sensible to cooperate, um, to go to the other side of the island um, if need be. Um, if it wasn't their decision, to create a reserve um, within, within their island um, that would uh, restrict their potential. This slide is all about our agreements. We have many, many, many agreements between us. Um, we've formalized an agreement uh, that we will um, work together. And we have many different structures. So when it comes to helping First Nations individuals, there are actually hundreds of staff in my office who are committed um, to helping you and helping uh, the individual, our super objective is to help the people. So um, our landscape, we have 203 BC um, First Nations communities. We have 32 different language groups, 32 different tribes. In, in Canada, a language group is a tribal grouping. That's a, a lot of chiefs, uh, 203 chiefs to get to uh, agree. And of all the, of the 650 First Nations in the entire country, a third of those First Nations are here. They're very diverse north to south. We have community health centers or nursing centers. We have nurse-based care in our um, largely small communities. The largest community we have uh, is in the Duncan area. It has 3,000 members, arguably the biggest a few communities who are trying to fight for that title. Um, but um, those communities can be highly organized. Duncan has over 100 brown workers who help uh, the people. And in some other places, there can be as few as um, 0.5 FTEs working on behalf of the people. And um, of course, superimposed on this, we have six provincial health authorities who help us with our health and well-being. Uh, before this, I was the deputy provincial health officer, and we had a legislative mandate to monitor the health of um, of the citizens of British Columbia. Uh, a couple of health statistics that we found, and these were the slides that I wanted to bring to you. One was showing that health utilization for First Nations people, uh, sorry, health service utilization for First Nations people is less than half of that of other British Columbians. And that was really quite shocking to us because we thought um, that populist notion was true, that First Nations people use the health system a lot and they use it inappropriately. Uh, we found that that wasn't true, and actually we had a diverging trend. First Nations people are actually using health services less and less and less over time. Uh, so why is that? The second slide I wanted to obtain for you was around HIV-related mortality for First Nations people and other residents of BC. HIV-related mortality was going up and up um, until about 1996 with the introduction of highly active antiretroviral therapy, which changed a uh, fatal disease uh, of AIDS uh, to a chronic disease and people could live on therapy seemingly as long as anybody else could live. Um, but for First Nations people in 1996, their HIV-related mortality, this tells me, 
extend to nine minutes. Uh, First Nations people, um, First Nations people mortality continued to go up even in spite of literally a magic pill, a magic bullet. So uh, it wasn't the quality of care, it wasn't um, the extreme strength of uh, medical technology and medications uh, that um, begat these outcomes. So what were the obstacles? In a province like British Columbia, some of the best care in the world, um, why were those magic pills, magic bullets, why wasn't that magic and that phenomenal resource um, reaching Aboriginal people's mouths? We don't really know, no one studied it, just like we haven't really studied why Aboriginal people don't have the same rights of transplantation as other um, residents of the country or the province, but we can supposition. And some of the obstacles that we've named, um, uh, just to name a few, and uh, there are a, a list of about 20 or 30 ideas that we put forward, um, are there prior experiences with the health system that perhaps they feel that the health system is not for them, that they've had debasing uh, colonial disrespectful um, experiences in the past, not all of them, but maybe even just one, to make them feel like not presenting in a timely manner. And of course, if they don't present early, if they present late, they are treated late and their outcomes can be much worse. Um, cultural competency of the um, institution that they're visiting. Um, my office receives complaints and I, for the 250,000 Aboriginal people in the province, there are almost 250,000 complaints, that's almost to a person, um, saying that they have not been treated well um, within the health system. Now I know this, this um, may not be a surprise to all of you. I think some of us have had experiences within the health system uh, where we felt affronted. But um, is the cultural competency of the worker an important institutional value or is it not? When, uh, when a, uh, the intake nurse says to you, hmm, you're Aboriginal. Aboriginal people get everything for free, don't they? Uh, what's your address? Th that kind of microaggression um, can prevent a person from coming back uh, for care. And of course, social access. Are our institutions reaching out to the hard to reach or do we just open our doors um, thinking that everyone who needs and deserves care will simply come through the door? Um, First Nations people have uh, set up uh, a system for, th sorry, for themselves um, through the First Nations Health Authority that's very holistic in its approach. And we asked tens of thousands of Aboriginal people, what do you want in your health system? And almost to a person they said in the top five of our thousands of comments, we want a holistic system, one that looks at our mind, body, and spirit. And we want a system that had a traditional approach. We grew up with particular ideas on how to be a strong person, a good person, uh, a strong parent, uh, uh, a woman with a great pregnancy, uh, how to be um, a strong teenager, how to work together, how to be um, respectful and humble. And we would like to um, have those um, within our own health system. And so the First Nations Health Authority does um, try and help First Nations people. Um, we call ourselves a wellness champion and we'd like to spend some of our resources allocated to us ups upstream, helping people protect their health rather than um, spending 90% uh, of our um, income on them in the last 10 years of their life. And we're very committed to looking at cultural humility uh, for health professionals where the health professional stoops to serve where the health professional says, maybe I could stop and listen, maybe I could do outreach, maybe I could do my very best for the clients that I am seemingly apparently failing to help look at these terrible um, statistics on health inequity. Um, let me uh, find out the best way possible so that um, I can be of service. So just to put it very simply, uh, I was in a, uh, after hundreds of meetings with the government to talk about how we can provide the best possible care I met with um, Lisa Lapointe, the chief coroner, about the return of an infant body um, to um, their family in a timely manner. Uh, Ms. Lapointe said, uh, well, you know, by law, by BC law, by the Coroner's Act, I am allowed to keep your baby's body um, for as long as I deem fit, up to two months, in order to determine the cause of death. And the chief slammed his fist down and he said, we know you think you're in charge, but we think that's our baby.
and it galvanized for me uh, exactly what first nations people out there are fighting for which is some input into what happens to their bodies um, and to their children's bodies so governance is a key element and governance is simply the question and we fight this out every day and we have for the last many years and first nations health who's in charge who's in charge of what in something like cancer or kidney health clearly it's an entity outside of us we're not asking for um, uh, a first nations uh, renal transplant center, we're not asking for a First Nations cancer center, clearly the lead uh, is with experts like yourselves. But certainly when it comes to uh, being at home and being with our loved ones, when it comes to pain management in our tiny towns, um, local care uh, is the best care. And First Nations people are showing that they can take care of themselves, and believe me, I've literally had bureaucrats say, we don't think you have the capacity to look after yourselves. They are looking after themselves. Um, and uh, they do see the sense in uh, cooperating uh, with experts like you in trying to have the best outcome possible. That's all, thank you.